Derek's je jealous of my hair. I'm, th I'm thinking he talked to my wife before that, because I'm sure she loaded him up on some of that stuff. I, uh, well, hi, I'm Brian. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and as a, uh, direct <laughs> as a direct result of taking and continuing to practice the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have not had a drink since March 6th of 1993. And, uh, and I'm telling you, that is a miracle. And... Um, and it's all due to God and Alcoholics Anonymous, good sponsorship. Um, my mom loves Alcoholics Anonymous. She loves that you brought her son home. And so does my dad, rest his, rest his soul. So I'm really grateful to be here. I'm like a little bit, well, I'm not even a little bit anything. I'm a lot nervous, and there's a lot of my heroes sitting in this room. Uh, last time I was at FOTS was 12 years ago. We were spying to start NEFOTS up in Maine. We took everything, brought it up there, and... So uh, we're also pregnant with my daughter, who's here with me. I, I want to say you guys are amazing. That I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how grateful and honored I am that you asked me to speak, and that then you would uh, invite my wife, uh, which allowed us to, you know, fly our kids in with us and be able to spend the weekend with our family here. Uh, it means a, a real lot to me. I mean, it's, I can't even tell you. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping. Well, I know God's going to speak through me. I mean, we did some prayer and meditation in the morning downstairs, and I know I need to get out of the way. I, I, you know, I come here to bear witness, and I'm telling you, uh, I am so blessed. I have such a blessed life. And I'm looking in the room, I mean, Mickey and Marie, and then I'm, I'm looking at Mary Thayer. And let me tell you about Mary Thayer. I met that woman 17 years ago in Maine. She's, besides my wife, she knows me the longest. And uh, she just came up to me and said, you know, I've never heard your story. And I'm like, you know, because we're just friends, you know. I'm sure she's heard pieces of it. Uh, and Tom and Juanita, Tony. So, and I did have a guy come up and say, you need to give a shout out to me. His name is Jeff from Arizona. So, a real knucklehead. That's my shout out. All right, I'm stalling. So, if you come up and thank me or, you know, say anything nice to me after, if you're either in, just inclined to and, you know, or your sponsor demands that of you, uh, I want you to know, and I know you already know this, but I want you to know that, I, that this is a gift from God. Anything that has given to me has been through God. So you're not thanking me, you're thanking God. And I know you know that, but I need you to know that I know that. I truly know that. Anytime I put self-will into my recovery, it has gone amok. So... Anything good is through the blessings of God. So I just want to say that. On the flip side, if you're out there on the patio and you're going like, wow, what was that? That sounds like a bad case of untreated alcoholism. If you do that, all right, you're judging God. And we, we don't do that in AA. Okay, so I'm officially off the hook. So I, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous um, in 1992. And I didn't come a willing participant. My pro officer sent me to you. I had just gotten uh, done spending six years in a federal penitentiary. And I was in an IOP. It wasn't an IOP. It was, it was, well, I don't know what it was, but it was intensive outpatient to me. And part of that was I was supposed to go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And I was going to this program on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, 6 to 9 p.m., and it was my first introduction to the possibility that I may have a problem with drugs or alcohol. And I was a master at hiding my alcoholism behind my drug addiction, which really, really stymied my recovery. But, so I, I would go to these things, and I, and I realized I had to have a sheet signed, and I realized really early um, that if you, uh, nobody's in charge in AA. So, you know, so I would just sign the sheets, you know, and... Uh, and when I ended up violating and going back to prison, the, uh, I remember my, my uh, professor asked me, he said, so what meeting do you go on Wednesday night? I always have my meeting list with me. He called me on the phone. I was checking in. 
and I whipped it out, and I said, oh, I go to the Wednesday night, and I, I, he goes, oh, when's the last time you were there? And I looked at where I'd signed it, and I'm, I gave him the day. He says, oh, that's weird. That meeting's been closed for six months. <laughs> See, my, the delusional thinking around my alcoholism, it, I was never in denial. I mean, that, there's, that, that's never been a, a vocabulary for me, because denying means I know something, and I'm just denying it. I was delusional. I really could not see the truth. I just couldn't see it. I didn't want to be an alcoholic. I was too young to be an alcoholic. I was too short to be an alcoholic. I was too, I could just invent all kinds of reasons. You know, I, I have crooked eyes. You can't be an alcoholic if you have crooked eyes. I don't know, I just invent stuff. Did not want to, because alcohol was the only thing that made me feel okay about me. Like, it was great hearing John on Thursday and hearing Aaron. I mean, Aaron, like, he is an alcoholic. I mean, he really, he described alcoholism really well. And alcohol did for me what, it, and it worked every time. It just linked everything up. And the idea that I would give that up was just, like, not even on the table. So I grew up in California. I grew up in a town called Stockton. And there's nothing really, I mean, there was trauma. In, but that's not why I'm alcoholic, okay? But there was stuff. My mom was the alcoholic in the house. Uh, and the only thing about that that's interesting that I brought into recovery was the dialogue between my mom and my father. Because my mom would come home, I was a latchkey kid in the 70s, so my mom would come home and she would say, uh, uh, she'd cook his food and then she'd say, I'm going to the bar with the girls, I'll be back in an hour. And my dad would have an argument, say, you're not going to be back in an hour, you're never back in an hour, and there'd be a big fight going on. And as a young kid, I would li listen and it would kind of scare me. It was always like, so I'd always back up a little bit and then my mom would go, and then about an hour later, two hours later, three hours later, my dad would get in the car and go get her and drag her out of the bar. And then they would have a fight. And the only thing I would hear through the wall was my mom didn't love us. My mom was weak. She had no willpower. And so I brought that dialogue of my dad's opinion of my mom's alcoholism into recovery. And I resented my mom immensely. I disrespected my mother. I resented my mom. I didn't want nothing to do with her. I thought she was weak. She had no moral fiber. And when I learned, when I started to go through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, uh, and it pained me, but what I learned was my mom was as powerless as I was, and that she believed every time, she believed it in her heart and in her soul, that it would be different when she went to that bar. And I judged her, and I punished her for that. And my dad died a year ago. Even to his death, he did not understand alcoholism, even though I tried to, I tried to explain it to him so many times. And finally, about, I don't know, Ken, Ken I remember Kenny, uh, Ken W. is my sponsor. I don't know if you know him from Silverton and Tucson. And Kenny would tell me things like, you know, you need to just let your dad think you got willpower. Like, why? why you, I kept trying to convince him it was God. It, you know, he believed you guys gave me a lot of willpower. He was so happy for the willpower you gave your son, his son. And even to his dying day, he believed that. Um, and you know what? He doesn't have to understand it. He just doesn't. And so nothing really happened except that I was a guy who never fit in, and I always blamed it on being short. I, always blamed, I was always the smallest in my class. I was, and I grew up in a rough neighborhood. Stockton, California is not a place. It's a place you want to be from. I guarantee you that. And I always was scrappy. I was one of those scrappy kids. And I would fight at the drop of a hat, and I never want to fight. I wasn't a, I wasn't a fighter, right? I mean, I was like, I'm cursed, really. I wasn't a fighter, and I'm not a lover. I mean, what am I, you know? I mean, it's so not fair, right? I was, but I would, always, I would always, like, I remember my brother, when I was a young kid, he would put boxing gloves on me on, in the summertime, and he would rope off the, the grass, and he would have me fight neighborhood kids. He was four years older than me. He'd always whisper in my ear, like, don't cry and don't leave. If you cry or you leave, I'm going to kick your butt. He didn't say it like that. He said more things. And so if you would beat me down, I would, I would just, like, chase you outside and jump on your back. I'm the type of guy who would bite you in the ear, you know, and grab on your leg, and, and I... Uh, and I brought that fight into my recovery. The idea of surrender is just foreign to me. Uh, I ran away from home at the age of 12, stole a boat. My brother was 16. We, got, we had a sandbar. The, they came and got us. Uh, my first introduction to the juvenile facility, you know, I didn't have to go in, but it was just introduction to this is where you're headed. My parents at the age of 14 did my first geographical for me. My, parent, my, brother, my oldest brother, who I ran away with, they kicked him out, and he went to go live with someone else. And at 14, I was an only child. My dad worked at IBM, and they got an opportunity to move to Tucson, and they took it. And I know today, even, they even told me they wanted to get me out of Stockton. They thought that that was the problem. Where I live is never the problem. Who I am is always the problem. 
And so my parents did a geographical. I moved to Tucson. And I remember as a 14-year-old kid thinking, that's it. I'm going to start new. I'm going to start fresh. New friends. I'm not going to do anything. And within six months, I was doing the same old thing. And my mom was an alcoholic, and so if I went to keg parties and during high school, I was given the green light to stay there and sleep in my car. And I think, think that's beautiful. My mom was like, she'd rather have me passed out in my car, parked on the side of the road, than driving home drunk. And so I drank. And I drank alcoholically pretty much from the beginning, though I could not see the signposts. 18, 1980, I moved out of, uh, I graduated from high school in 1980, I moved out. And I moved in with four guys. It was, when Aaron was talking, I'm like, that was my story. I mean, there was four of us, but we were all alcoholics. And we destroyed that house. And I got kicked out six months later, and that became this whole three-year run. And I was a daily drinker for three years. And I was a daily drinker because, you know what, I work hard, and I deserve to drink. But I would, I would say things like, I had a buddy named Steve who would drink in the morning. And I would always look at Steve, and I'd say, yeah, if I ever get like Steve, I may look at my drinking. But I'm smoking enough weed in the morning to cripple a baby giraffe, but I'm not like, <laughs> like I'm not drinking in the morning. So I'm thinking I don't have a problem. But around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm thinking that's all I can think about. In fact, on the way to the liquor store from the job site, just knowing I was going to go to the liquor store, just knowing it, I would get a sense of relief just on the idea that I'm heading there. And the closer I got to the liquor store, the better I felt. Now, I couldn't identify that as alcoholism, but I can tell you that's alcoholism. I mean, just knowing it, drive up to the drive through liquor store, two 16-ounce buds in a bag, and then a six-pack, which was ludicrous because I always went back or I went out that night. Then I started doing a lot of outside substances. You know, I did a lot of, a lot of outside stuff and uh, started dealing drugs. I became a drug dealer, and I was addicted to the drugs I was dealing, which is not a recipe for success. It's just a, it's destined for failure, and I'm really good at telling people what they want to hear. So I started burning drug dealers all over Tucson. I might go to, I'd go to like five different guys and say, look, I know you just gave me an ounce, uh, but I got some more coming. I fronted this out, and I would play this game, and I did that for about a year and a half. And I started, you know, at the age of 21, I was, I was really tired at the age of 21 playing this game. I was constantly in motion, and I uh, got to a place one night, and I... <laughs> If you looked at my life from the outside, you would have thought it was okay. I mean, I had a fiance. I, I, I had a pinto. <laughs> I mean, it, didn't, it wasn't running, but I had it. I lived in a house. You know, I was dealing drugs. I thought I was somebody. I'd go to the bars, you know, and I would go to the bars down by the University of Arizona, and I would, I would burn frat boys, you know. I would, like, sell them stuff that wasn't real. And I was playing games, and I was getting out of control. But inside, I was dying. Inside, I would, you know, I would look in the mirror and just knew I was a fraud. Just know it. I'm a fraud. I don't, what's going on? And I was getting so desperate and so, like, and I'm not a depressed guy. I'm not one of those guys who's ever really gone into a depression. I've never been a guy... I mean, maybe when I, like, 13 or 14, when I would listen to songs like Seasons in the Sun or some crazy, you know, maybe for a little bit. But I'm not full of angst. I've never been that way. I've always been kind of positive. I've always, like, my, my glass is always full. And uh, even when I don't even have a glass, my glass is full. Even when there's not even anything near a glass around me, my glass is full. I've always been able to be positive, but this night was different. And I got really depressed, and I was going to check out. I was really just going to check out. And I took my roommate's car, uh, and I just cut off a piece of hose, and I went out to die. And I think about this, and I talk about this, because, you know, at the age of 21, like, people come in Alcoholics Anonymous so young today, and it's such a gift, because at the age of 21, I was done. Like, I was done. I was drinking daily. I could not control the amount of alcohol I drank. I would start drinking. I would say, I'm only going to go to, you know, uh, the Wildcat house for an hour, and I would be there till shut down, you know. I'd be passing out all over the place. I... I, I, was a, I was a train wreck, and I was done this night. And I went out to the desert, and I started uh, pumping fumes into my car. And, uh, you know, like, my kids are here. If you see me with my kids, like, I'm so blessed. I, I didn't have a – my daughter wasn't born until I was 40 years old. Like, I never thought that was on the, on the card. I didn't think it was on the table. And I'm thinking how close I would be to miss it all if I'd gone through what I was going to go through that night. And I was writing letters, and I, and I hadn't had – action or really a selfless thought in at least two or three years. 
And I started to write a letter to my mom. And this is, I mean, God spoke to me this night. It was real clear, like, you can't do this to your mother. My mother had buried, a, my brother Chucky died in 1967 of leukemia. He was two years older than me. And I watched what that death did to my family. I watched how my mom buried her pain in a bottle and my dad buried his pain in work. And I watched how that just ripped us apart and how painful that was. And I kind of knew it, but I knew it really that night. I can't have my mom find me in a car. And, uh, and so I came out of the car. I just unplugged it. And I, and I, and I still... You know, I remember, like, it was uh, uh, out in the desert. If you're, out, you know, this is Tucson out in the desert, and it was, um, like, November, so it gets really cold, and I walked all night trying to figure out what I could do to fix my problem. And if you're going to fix a problem, you've got to know what the real problem is. And see, I'm really notorious at not really knowing what the real problem is, and what the real problem that I could see was I just didn't have enough money. It wasn't that I was drinking every day, that I was robbing drug dealers. It wasn't that I was, uh, uh, you know, I owed tens of thousands of dollars to people. It wasn't, it wasn't any of that. It was, I just didn't have enough money. If I could just get money. And I was making seven bucks an hour painting houses. I knew that. I mean, I did the math. That ain't going to work. And uh, so I drove into town and I robbed a bank. And, uh, and it was plain as that. I didn't have a plan. It's not like I, you know, like I love watching cop and robber shows where they plan everything. That wasn't my gig. I had my roommate's car for one. And I had no gun. I had a note. I had a pen, and I, I did park about a block, and, and, and this is how it went. I was uh, five foot one, about 90 pounds. That's a real, about what I weighed, maybe 95 on a good day. I was really kind of strung out. And I uh, walked into the bank, and I wrote a note, and the note said, uh, I have a gun because I want, I didn't, I, and I didn't want to cause a commotion, so I waited in line, because I think, you, could, you know, <laughs> like you should just wait in line if you're going to rob a bank. I mean... I don't want anyone knowing I'm robbing it because I think that the, the lady behind the counter could have definitely tackled me and beat me to a pulp, all right? <laughs> and uh, I said, this, I have a gun. <laughs> I have a gun. Give me $50 or I'll kill you. That's what I said. <laughs> Whatever. And it was kind of like, you know, walking up and like hitting her hand and they're like, hey, lady, down here. And uh, so uh, and she gave me $50. She slid a $50 bill and then I ran. And I remember, I remember like having this freeze where we looked at each other and I'm sure her eyes were like, you're an idiot. And I ran and I got to my roommate's car and I drove to 7-Eleven. I got a 12-pack of Budweiser and I just, I remember drinking two or three, four real quick. I mean, just drank and I just got, and then I realized I got to do something different. So I went all the way across town and I robbed another bank an hour later. And when I got arrested, the FBI told me, they said, you know, we were doing a bank robbery seminar at that bank when we got the call for the first one you did. And we got out, we closed shop, we went across town. As we were driving across town, you drove and must have crossed paths and robbed the bank we were doing that seminar at. They were really worried. They had like some mastermind, you know. And <laughs> I'm sure until they read the note. And they're like, okay, come on. <laughs> and then I went to work the next day. You know, I remember uh, I went to work. And this guy, this guy, Dave, who I was working with, he was an engineering student at the University of Arizona. And he really smart guy. And he dropped out. And I had brought him right into all the mix of my madness. I mean, I was doing everything with him. And... Uh, I destroyed this guy's life. If, 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 if the, for a second, I don't think that I have power over other people in the sense of he got sucked right into my madness and I destroyed this man's life. And uh, he asked me the next day, he said, uh, he said, they saw it on the news, you know, 17-year-old Rob's bank. That's what they called me. They said I was 17. I was insulted. Uh, I was 21. Are you kidding me? I couldn't grow facial hair. I mean, I probably looked 17. So he asked me, he said, because he knew I was hurting financially, and I played it off. But I, and I'm like, the, I'm like the actor, man. I'm like so Jekyll and Hyde. I'm so different. You know, like I, nobody believed it, nobody. And then about six months later, I just take my boss's van and drive into town and rob another bank during lunch hour. And, uh, and I really believe in my mind that, that this is just never going to end. Like, whatever, you just need money. You just go get it. How cool is that? You know, like, you just go get money. They'll just give it to you. I mean, they don't even ask. They just, all you got to do is say you got a gun, like, boo. And they're just like, okay. And... 
completely clueless that I was really making the FBI pretty angry. And, uh, and anyway, to make a really lame story, right? I mean, come on, $50. And I, and I uh, got arrested. I got arrested two weeks later. And what ha- well, here's what happened. This type of guy, just a description of the guys I run with. When I came home after the second bank robbery, about two weeks after the, the third bank robbery, uh, and this again, this is six months later, so I got three bank robberies in six months. P- my picture comes out in the paper. It wasn't me, it wasn't my name, it was just a picture, like 88 crime. If you know this guy, he's wanted for three bank robberies. And my roommates in their, like, pot smoking haze had clipped it out and put it on the refrigerator. <laughs> I'm assuming they did that before they started smoking weed that night, but they, whatever, they, they clipped it out, and I came home from work. And I did what I did. I brought my booze, I put it in the refrigerator, and that picture was there, and my knee started to buckle, and I composed myself really good. And I just, like, I brought it out. I just ripped it down. I said, what's up? What's up with that? And they're like, dude, man, some dude's running around town and Robin Banks looks just like you. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. And so I didn't do anything. You know, I didn't run. I didn't go on the run. I didn't go to Mexico. You know, I'm in Tucson. I'm like really close. I, I just didn't think. I didn't think inability to really see the truth. I was just so blind. I was so crazy. I can't even believe today when I tell this story how really insane my life was. And then, uh, I, then I got arrested two weeks later. And my dad bailed me out. My mom and dad bailed me out. They got me a lawyer. And the lawyer told me the truth. I was going to go to prison for 10 years. And, uh, and two weeks before I went to trial for that bank robbery, I robbed another bank. I told you, I'm not a quitter. I mean, when you're 21 and you think you're going to jail for 10 years, 30 is like ancient. I know there's a bunch of young guys here. 30 is like old. Like that, you don't even think you're going to live past 30, the way I was running my life. So I was just like, yeah, you know what? Who cares? Three in the bucket. Might as well just do one more. What's the use? And, uh, and that was a, I, I can't even tell you. I don't have enough time to tell you how. I mean, I did a really good makeup job, and I got a dye pack in it, blew up in the parking lot. I, it was a nightmare bank robbery, but I got away with it on a Friday because I know I'm going to party all weekend. I know I'm going to get through the weekend before they look at the tapes and do anything. I know that. And Monday they arrested me, and I went to prison. And I, and I did nothing in prison. I did nothing to better my life. I didn't go to any AA. I didn't go to CA. I didn't go to therapy. I didn't do anything in prison but learn how to make wine and make connections all across. You know, federal prisons like notorious for making connections around the world. And so I just didn't do anything but play the game. And some of that was to save my life. When you're five foot one and you weigh 95 pounds and you're going into a federal penitentiary, like you learn to get along and you learn to play the game. Anybody watch Game of Thrones? It's my new favorite show. Like I was totally playing the Game of Thrones way back before they even invented it. Man, I was like, I wasn't like Tyrion. I wasn't that small, but I was still, like I learned, I have no idea where that came from. I didn't, look, I prayed, so don't even judge me. I am so off the hook. So, nothing. I get out, and I think, I'm not 28 years old. I think I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to start my life over, and I'll do nothing. There is no such thing. Tom, I told me this year, he goes, there's no such thing as a gate conversion. There's no such thing as guys going to, you know, like not drinking or not partying for eight, five years, or you know, ten years, whatever. But truthfully, I wasn't even sober. I was barely sober when I left. I, this idea that I'll change my life. And I got out and they told me the conditions. Here's the conditions you have to stay on parole. And I violated them all because I'm not alcoholic, so I'm going to drink. I won't do drugs, but I, I, I won't drink. But when I start drinking, I, I'm a blackout drinker, man. I don't know what happens when I drink. I go places. I wake up in places. I don't know. So I went back to prison for a year. And the only difference between this last one, so after seven years in prison, the only thing that happened was my mom, and this is why I love Al-Anon. My mom was in a bowling league. My mom never really entered Al-Anon, but I'm telling you right now, a lady in Al-Anon who was on my mom's bowling league told my mom the truth. She made my mom's business her business. She told my mom the truth, and she said, you are killing your boy. Stop saving him. I never know who this woman is, but this woman saved my life because my mom wrote me a letter and said, you cannot come home. I love you too much to watch you die in my house. And when I made amends to my mom, I went into resentment inventory, hating my mom and how dare her not pick me up. I'm I'm 28 years old. How dare her not save me, right? I went in inventory that way, came out owing her a huge amount of amends. When I saw my mistakes, how I realized that I made my mom do that, 
And I made amends on my mom, and she, I remember telling her, and this is what she told me, and I, and I, to this day, it's still, like when we say we're not regret the past, I got to tell you, I'm not there yet with this, because I still regret making my mom do this. I still, there's still a regret around this. Is my mom told me, as I made amends to my mom, and I was like four or five months sober, and uh, she, I asked her if there, you know, I told her what I was going to do, blah, and I did the whole men's the way Kenneth told me to, and then I said, is there anything you want to share? And she said, yeah, I got lots to share. <laughs> and I sat down, and my mom's a talker, and she, during this process, told me, she said, you know, it was harder to write that letter to you than it was to bury your brother Chucky. And that's not dramatic for my mom. That's like legit, in-your-face truth. Like, that's the truth. And I couldn't get I couldn't understand. Four months of sobriety, I could not wrap my head around that. And I asked her, I said, what do you mean? Like, I don't get that. She said, Brian, when Chucky had cancer, when he got leukemia, we gave him to the doctors and said, you know, fix our boy. Like, please fix our boy. But with you, with you, I'd put the letter in the mailbox, and then I'd go pull it back. And I put the mail, and it wasn't until your father put his hand on my shoulder and said, let him go. And the lie I brought in Alcoholics Anonymous for a while, and initially was, you know, why don't you just get off my back and leave me alone because I'm not hurting anybody but myself. And uh, so I ended up at this uh, New Beginnings Treatment Center in uh, downtown Tucson. And I'm not alcoholic, and I've got to be there for four months, and they tell me I can't drink and I can't use drugs. And I said, so I can do, I cannot drink for four months. I cannot do drugs. I have $60 to my name. I'm 29 years old. But I'm not alcoholic. I have $60 to my name. That's it. I've got no bank account, no job. I've got the clothes on my back. I'm homeless, living downtown on Oracle and Grant, right next to the Notel Motel, quality neighborhood. That's not where I planned on being. I grew up with a pretty decent home, always had things. Now I got nothing. The first day out, I walk out and I end up in a liquor store. The first day, I got to go look for a job from 8 to 5. I find myself in a liquor store, and it's not even really a thought. I mean, sure, there's a little bit of rationalization going in there, like, I don't have to be back till 5 o'clock. I haven't had real alcohol in a year. Who are they to say I can't drink? I'm not alcoholic. Of course I can drink. Got a bottle of vodka and went across, and got in a brown paper bag and went across to the park with all the other winners and started talking about how wrong society was. Took a few shots, and it was magical. It, the angst, and the, just the uncomfortableness, the restless, irritable, and discontent that was just reaping through my veins, it all went away. It was like the fear of what am I going to do. Once I start drinking, all that fear goes away. Man, I'm like, I got the world. Even though I'm homeless, I got nothing going on. Once I put some booze in me, man, I'm the master of my universe, and I'm all good. And, uh, and I, I drank a few drinks, and I shut it down. I did that for three days, and the fourth day, I didn't want to come back on property without booze because I was... And when I came back on, it was a lockdown. I would think about alcohol all night. Like, why didn't I bring some back? Fourth day, I brought it back. I got drunk. Went to bed at midnight. They breathalyzed me at one. My professor came on Monday. And instead of sending me to prison, he told me something that was magical. And even to the, even to the day, the last day I talked to him, I was about six years sober because I'd call him every year on my anniversary and say, Hey, Tim, because he told me something. He said, I want to sit you down. I remember he called my name over the PA. They said, Brian Perkox to the, to the front office. I brought my little commissary, you know, my, my cosmetic, you know, shampoo and toothpaste. I don't want to do powder. And I, I have my little bag here, and he says, what's that? And I said, well, you're going to lock me up. I, I, you know, it's just my stuff. He goes, uh, why don't you sit down? I want to talk to you. I said, okay. He says, look, I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for seven years. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't even know why I'm doing this. I'm going to give you a break. Like, sending you back to prison for another eight months is not going to fix you. You keep thinking you're a drug addict, and you may be, but you, my friend, are an alcoholic. And I'm going to recommend to the parole commission that you go to AA. And you have to go every day you're here. And if you miss one meeting, if you get one write-up at this halfway house, if you don't do what they ask you to do, I will violate you. And I don't even know why I'm giving you this break, but I'm going to do it. And I don't even know if the parole commission is going to be okay with it, but I'm going to do it. And I started to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I started to go to this place called the Northwest Alano Club in Tucson. And I used to take the bus there, which was insulting to a guy of my stature. I'm like, I'm, you know... I'm Shorty P, man. Come on. Are you kidding me? I take the bus, you know? But you know, I'm a gangster, you know? In fact, I didn't tell anybody I only got $50 on, the ba- on my bank until my wife found out. Then she's like, you need to start being honest with people, you know? Uh, I got on the bus. I go to the meetings. And I'll tell you, I was so afraid to go to AA, but I went to AA. Uh, 
Magical Minds, where I met Ken, Ken W., my sponsor. I met him in those meetings. I, uh, I didn't like him because in that meeting there was like three different groups of people. There was people who uh, were talking about four steps and amends and big book and inventory and God and that stuff. And there was another group in that meeting who were talking about just don't drink and uh, go to meetings and just don't drink and go to meetings and sometimes you go to topless bars. And then there was another guy, another group, and they were talking about therapy and teddy bears. And I, Look, I'm a, the path of least resistance. This looked like work. That's too foo-foo for me. But these guys going to clubs and, you know, like not drink, I could do that. I underestimated the power of alcoholism. And so I just underestimated. And so I hung out with these guys. I did nothing for my recovery. I did nothing in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I went to a lot of meetings. I went to two meetings a day. I was a meeting maker. I made it to meetings. <laughs> what happened is, at nine months, I started going insane. I got a job at a treatment center being a jockey, which is like, wow, weird, huh? And uh, don't even like horses. I didn't like horses that much. And I, I went there, and, and, and I was going to two meetings a day. Nine months, I, went, I started dealing drugs in Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't do that. <laughs> it's not a good job for a newcomer. And then I drank. Two weeks after my year anniversary, I drank. Three months. 93, from, March, from January to March. I mean, late December to, to March. I was drinking every day. While working at a treatment center, I was, I was drinking every day. And I would get up and I'd say, that's it, I'm not going to do it again. And I'd, after the second AA meeting, I would find myself at a bar. I'd drive back drunk to this treatment center, sneak on property and go in, lock my door. It was crazy. It was insane. From March 1st to March 6th, I thought about nothing but killing myself because AA didn't work. Or I could rob banks in Phoenix and then go to Vegas and be a poker player. Now, you laugh, but I'm telling you, with that thought in my head, I would have took that one. On March 6th of 93, a guy walked into my trailer, a running partner of mine in AA, a, what I call my AA road dog. Everyone has one. And him and I were running hard together, and he pulled my car, and he said to me, how long have you been sober? And I was insulted because it was my year anniversary three months ago, so I'm like, I thought it was a trick question. But deep down, I knew he knew. People around me were watching me die. And he said what everybody else was saying. He goes, look, man, how long have you been sober? I'm like, dude, you're at my anniversary. He goes, no, how long? And I started to get up because I was going to bow up to him. And I started to get up, and he got in my face. And he's not a violent guy. I mean, he's all tattooed up, but he's like a, uh, you know, I mean, he, he's like a Buddhist. I always thought he was a Buddhist. He's like an angry Buddhist at this moment, you know. <laughs> Which I don't even know if there is some, but he would definitely, he, he looked like an angry Buddhist. And he got in my face, and he said to me, I love you like a brother. I'm not going to watch you die. How long have you been sober? And I completely surrendered on that day. I don't know why on March 6th. I truly believe there's two major surrenders that have to happen. Surrender to the bottle, and then I have to surrender my will. And on that day, I surrendered both. I just, I just started crying. I couldn't stop. I was scared. And the guy who owned the treatment center, I thought he was going to kick me out. And I, I was like, where am I going to live? I'm homeless. My parents don't want me. And he called me up. He said, you can't work for me. I said, I know that, Ted. And he says, but you can be a patient if you'd like to be. I went from driving the vans to the meetings to being a client within a day. And I had, I, I had a choice. I didn't have to do that. I could have left. And I remember, my wife's in the room today, I remember sitting on the couch and I wanted to, I wanted to run so bad. I, wanted, I did not want to sit in the circle and say I'd been drinking. And people held on to me, man. People held on to me. I was so, I would have died. I would have been, I know I would be dead. And I sat through that. Scariest thing I ever did, get real. Be authentic. Just to be authentic. I'm a failure. I failed one more time. Okay, we love you. Let's go. And I got Ken. I remember I was two days later, March 8th, I, got, I went to an A meeting, and I asked Ken W. to be my sponsor, and I knew I needed him. He wasn't a big, like, out there kind of guy, you know. He was just a common, like, run-of-the-mill, solid member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was solid, and he was spiritual. He was my age. He was 29. Well, I was about ready to turn 30. I just turned 30. He was born the same year. He had seven years sobriety. I had nothing. And I said, will you sponsor me? And he said, absolutely. I would love to sponsor you. And he gave me his big book. He said, here. He said, I want you to read page 84 to 88, and I will see you on Tuesday. This was Sunday. Monday, I stayed at the treatment center. Tuesday, he came out.
told me to remove from my idea that I'd actually been an Alcoholics Anonymous because I had not been an Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, what do you think Alcoholics Anonymous is? There's only one program. It's the 12 steps. Did you do that? I said, no. Then don't lie to yourself. Don't act like you've been in AA. You were just hanging out with a bunch of people who don't drink. And maybe they were in AA, but you're just a, you know, you're like a tourist here. He didn't say that, but that's what he should have said. That's what it was. I mean, I was a tourist in AA. I was just visiting. Just hang out, you know. You guys got a nice, nice view, you know. I'm not going to do anything. And uh, he started to walk me through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. He walked me to God. It was the journey that I needed. And I was such an atheist. I was so angry at God. I was so mad. In fact, I hated the solution. I did not like the solution that you have. didn't want it. I remember him telling me, I don't even like your solution. He said, you don't have to like it. You just have to do it. And we started this journey through the 12 steps. And my journey through the 12 steps have completely transformed my life. I am not the man I was 20 years ago, I'm telling you, but I can become him. Oh, I can go back. Just because I've been awakened, just because I'm a recovered alcoholic, I do not live in the delusion that I can't drink again. I'm real clear, if I stop treating my spiritual nature, I'm telling you, if I don't grow spiritually, and I've got very sick in Alcoholics Anonymous, I met my wife in that rehab. I know, all these sponsors, right, right now, if you've got a newcomer next to you, fold their ears. I met my wife <laughs> in treatment. There's only two people, the, the two people in this room who know me the most is my wife. She's known me for 20 years. Well, she's known me for 21 years, because she likes to say she'll be 21 years sober in July, so she's got nine months more than I do. <laughs> Whenever I get my year, like when I get, when I get 21, she'll send me a text saying, oh, I remember, that was such a cute time when I got sober. <laughs> That's what she'll send to me. Trust me, she will. She's like my moral fiber, I'm telling you. That woman there grounds me. Left to my own devices, man. I am a, I'm, just, I'm an egomaniac. I remember... Uh, well, we met in treatment, and then we moved out, and then we got a year sober, and, uh, and I was in the process of, you know, and I would go around, and I, would, I was like, Kenny said, like, you got to make, you got you to make, before you move to Maine, I was moving to Maine, I mean, when you're, you're, I'm from Tucson, Arizona, California, my wife was from Maine, she wanted to move there, that's a typical newcomer move, right, from uh, the desert to New England, but I was game, like, I'm in. Like, I did this third step, I wrote this inventory, I did this fifth step, I'm game, let's go. I started making amends, and I'm not going to get down to the mechanics, but I'm going to tell you some of the journey that I've had on some of what's happened on the transformation about me and my relationship with my family, my career, who I am as a man, a father, a husband. I'm not capable of doing the things I do without God's aid. I'm not capable of doing it, trust me. My run in my life on my will got me homeless a convicted felon. Destroyed every relationship. At a year sober, we moved to Maine, and me and my wife had to grow up in Alcoholics Anonymous because they weren't doing AA the way they should be doing AA in Maine. Well, and they probably, there's some truth to that. And I would take my, I was in my evangelical phase. I was a, um, well, I say I, I don't want to put her in the picture, but I would say I would do drive-bys we would do drive-bys and AA meetings, put it that way. We would basically go and do drive-bys at AA meetings. And, uh, and we were young. I mean, I was, I'm 11 years older than her, but I'm still a baby. And we were like one, two years sober. And, and we, there was no big book in our area. There was nothing. But we were so hungry. Mary Thayer was up in Brunswick about an hour north, but I didn't know who she was, you know. And we were down in the Midcoast area, and we were on fire, man. We loved Alcoholics Anonymous. We went to so many meetings. We started so much trauma in our area. I mean, eventually you grow out of that, but we were like, you know. And, and I'm not proud of that, but I definitely was not practicing the principles that I was talking about. I mean, love and tolerance of others is our code. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, a respect for their opinions and viewpoints. Pfft, doesn't mean, you know, let's just take that page out of the big book. I don't even know why it's there. <laughs> we avoid retaliation argument? Pff, hardly. And I would hide it behind a self-seeking motive, which is they're killing alcoholics here. Don P. told me, he said, Brian, you change AA one drunk at a time. Sit down with a man, break the book open, guide him to God. But I wanted to do it grandiose and... Uh, and I started getting involved in Alcoholics Anonymous at a very passionate level. And I'm as passionate today as I was. I am so grateful. I, I made amends before I left. to Like, I would go into Walmart, and I remember, uh, well, here's an amends, and I'll tell you what happened. And this kind of ties in. 
What time do we end? 1140? 1130? Okay. I'm going to tell you some things that have happened in the most recent, which have been have a huge impact on me. So my dad died a year ago. And it was one of those real sudden things. We, me and my wife and my kids were there in October of the previous year, and he was healthy. He was fine. It was good. And, uh, okay, thank you. I thought you were ripping me off on time. I was like, <laughs> I'm still going to tell this story, even though it's a little premature, but I'm telling you, this is more recent stuff. This happened a year ago, and I'm telling you, I am so grateful. When we talk about the fellowship of the Spirit, like three years ago, there was a friend of mine called me, and he was dying. He had walked away from AA. He was dying in AA, and he called me up out of the blue. And he instantly, I'm in, the, I'm in my parking lot talking to him, and he's dying. He's like, he, he doesn't know how close he is to a drink. And instantly in my thought, I need to give him Mickey's number. And I said, you need to call Mickey. He goes, who's he? I said, well, obviously you don't know who he is because you're not going to AA meeting, so you need to go and call him. And he called Mickey. Even though they're not really sponsored today, Mickey saved his life. And he told me that not even a week ago. He told me, like, if it wasn't for that. So I love that there's a fellowship of the Spirit within the fellowship. I love that. And so what happened uh, a year ago, my, my, I, I, we visited. I was living in Texas. We moved, I moved to Texas for a job, and the kids and Chloe were in Maine, so we were separated for nine months, and I'd go back. It was, it was an okay time. We'd been separated before, not, like, badly separated, just situational separation. And uh, I was sitting in uh, Austin, Texas, Round Rock, Texas, and I had this intuitive thought my dad had been having some strokes, and everybody in my family said he was fine. They're all like, he's fine, he's good. I, I even asked my brother, I said, should I go visit him? Like, he just got out of the hospital, and he was back into my mom's home, and they said, no, he's fine. I'm like, and I was just there six months, so I listened to my brother and my mom and my other brother. And then about a week later, I came out of meditation, and this thought popped into me. Like, it was clear. Like, listening to God is the key here. I'm good at talking to God. I can ask away but do I truly listen? See, I'm believing that, you know, like if I really listen, and God's voice is never loud for me, it's always, and it's always in my voice. It'd be great if it was like, no, do not do that. <laughs> but it's, it's never the way it is. It's always in my voice. And so what happened is, it was clear to me, you've got to go see your dad. And it didn't make sense. Everyone said he was fine. I remember telling Chloe, I think I'm going to go see my dad. I think I'm going to go visit. And uh, he's at home. He's living at my mom's. So he's back home with my mom. And, and, I, went back, and I went back on a, a Thursday or Friday. And uh, within Sunday, he was in the hospital. He just started slipping. And my mom was delusional. My mom was like, he's fine. I'm like, mom, he's dying in the room. And my mom was like, no, he's okay. I mean, it was clear to me. I'm like, oh, my God, my mom... She married to this man for 50 years. She doesn't want him to die. And so she's believing what she wants to see. And I had to call 911. I had to hold my mom and say, Mom, he's dying. I mean, I would have to lift him up. Me and my brother would lift him up and take him to the bathroom. He was dying. He's not okay. 911 came. And like, if you hadn't called, you know, he was going to die within a day. I mean, he was dehydrated. She, she was doing what she thought was best, but he was dying. If I don't listen to God, I don't get there for that. I don't call my older brother and said, you've got to get down here. And I stayed for a few more days. He went to the hospital, and they, they labeled him out. I thought he was going to be fine. You know, he just had, it was, they started working on it. They didn't really know what was going on. They didn't know if it was cancer. And in my work, I had to go back to work. And he was in the hospital, and they said he was going to go to a nursing home. And, and then about a week, two weeks later, I get a text, because that's how my family does it. They send me a text. Who gets a text the day your dad dies? My brother. By the way, dad died. It was on a Saturday. I happened to be going to Santa Fe for a work conference the next day. This is on a Saturday. My dad died. I'm so glad I got to spend some time. I'm so glad I got to climb in bed with my dad and tell him I loved him. I'm glad that he got to see me healed. He got to see a recovered son. He got to see his grandkids. He never believed it would happen. I've been married to this woman for I'll be 19 years this year. I've never came over having a relationship. He got to see all that. The son he always deserved had arrived. And he got to see it before he died. And I was going to Santa Fe, and this is how it works. I mean, this is why I love the Fellowship of the Spirit, because I have friends all over. I have family all over the country. And I was telling Tom, I said, Tom, I'm going to come for a work conference. I'll be there Sunday. They pick us up, and on Sunday, we're speaking at a detox Sunday night. Well, that's the deal. Monday night, I'm speaking at their home group. I don't even have time to think about my, like, sadness. I mean, just get me busy. I mean, I could do the work. I remember calling Chloe, like, yeah, this out, out, uh, altitude, I feel a little sad. This out, I think the altitude's getting me. And she's, she goes, oh, my God. She says, only you would blame.
throw sadness on al altitude sickness. <laughs> she says, your dad just died. It's okay to be sad. And then on Wednesday, we went to Tom and Juanita's and had dinner, homemade dinner. And on Thursday, I got to go. And here's what happened. I show up on Thursday. I start getting texts from guys that I used their car. And these are guys I made amends to that I had used their car in bank robberies. I had, I had stolen from some of them, but I had made amends. These guys shot me texts saying, hey, we read that your dad's service was today. Can we go to your service? Will you be okay if we show up to the service? Guys that I ran heavy and hard with, guys that I committed serious crimes with and that I really damaged because of Alcoholics Anonymous and I was to heal those relationships, asked me. They wanted to be there for me. And uh, when I got out of prison the very first time, or the last time that I got arrested, uh, my dad had got me a job with his golf buddy. He owned a, he owned a pest control company, and I, I had a commercial account. I mean, I shouldn't even have had the account. I just got it, and, uh, and I burned it to the ground. I got arrested. I was on the run from the feds, and the marshals arrested me coming out of a 7-Eleven, a whole other fun story, you know, beating up them. We're trying to assault a federal marshal. Don't do that. I'm going to let you know. I got really beat up really bad that day. And anyway, I had to make amends to this guy because I stole money, and, I, and his... You know, they had to go, he had to go get his car, his truck, his work truck from the 7-Eleven because his employee just got arrested by the federal marshals. And I had gone, I remember Chloe was with me when I went, made amends. I sat in the parking lot and I said, I'm really scared to make amends to this guy because he gave me so much. And I made amends to him, paid him back his money, and I healed it. Even golfed with him for many years after. And, uh, and I hadn't seen him in years. And I was sitting on the day of my dad's service, and it was Saturday morning. I was at this hotel by myself, and I was really sad. I was just like feeling like what you're supposed to feel when your dad's died, dead. You know, I was just feeling what it, what it was. I, was. I was really present to God. Truly present. And this phone rang, and it was from a number I did not recognize, and, it didn't make, and I wasn't going to answer it. I just wasn't going to answer it. And uh, I, I just picked it up. And I said, hey. I said, hello. And he said, hey, kid, how are you? And I knew the way he said, hey, kid, it was Al, the guy who owned his pest control company that I stole from and my dad's one of my dad's best friend and he said how you doing kid and I said I'm not doing too good Al he says yeah I get that he says I just called to uh, let you know a few things I said okay he said first I'm not gonna make it to your dad's service my wife will be there but I can't make it my son was murdered a month ago and I'm down on the gallows trying to figure out what happened and I can't get I can't get there I said okay he said but I want to tell you something that you need to know about your dad. He goes, I golf with your dad and up until he couldn't golf anymore for at least 10 years. And every time I golf him on Sunday, all he could talk about was how proud he was of you. How truly proud he was of you. You guys gave me that relationship. And this guy had made it his business to call and tell me that in the midst of his own pain. And I went to the service and I had to give a eulogy. And uh, I don't know what I said, but in the, uh, in the audience were the very first sponsor I ever had, Kenny, some AA people. I, these people showed up for me. And then in the audience were the guys I used to rob, I, rob, I used their car for bank robberies. I mean... These are guys I, I dealt drugs with, who we robbed people with. I mean, these guys were like there for me. I was so like touched at the power of God, that the healing of God. I mean, when I say I'm blessed, I, I mean that in a huge way because I can't even, I, there, I really believe that I don't deserve the blessings that I've gotten. And a lot of it has been like, I'm a guy, a visual guy, like I believe there's two wills, like there's God's will and mine, and everybody has that. And when I was born, and I know this because I have babies, man, they're so pure. Like my kids when they were young, they don't have any judgment about anybody, race, color, whoever, whatever. I mean, they just don't care. And uh, I started to slide this way. I walked so far from God. And when I came back in, I was so far from God, I just couldn't even see the possibility of a relationship with my creator. Couldn't see it. And everything in between was all the 12 steps just took everything and just connected me back to God. And as I've started to go back, I've gone this way. And I've swayed pretty far. You know, I, I, I swayed when I was about 11 years sober. I used to tell Don, I started getting asked to speak a lot. And I would tell Don, I called Don up and I, and I met Don like back in 96. I really wasn't looking for Don, I was looking for Joe H. I, it was a funny guy. I called him looking for Joe and Joe was in Australia. Mary Thayer.
get Joe, you need to get Don. I'm like, ah, you know, I was going to do a big book weekend. And I, call, I, I, was a, you know, I was a gunslinger, you know, I wanted Joe, you know, Joe and Mark. And so I went and I, anyway, he wasn't there. And so I called, maybe, maybe his sponsor, that old guy Don. And uh, I remember calling Don up on a Sunday and he didn't know me from anything. He just some goof calls him. And I said, hey, I'm looking for Joe H. And he goes, yeah, he's not, he's in Australia. I said, what about you? You do big book weekends? <laughs> he goes, I've been known to do a few. That's how I met the man and uh, flew him out and had just, and that started, I mean, a lot of people. And uh, as I got closer, as I started, I remember I was starting to get asked to speak. I remember calling Don one time and I said, you know, I'm a little scared about this because I'm speaking a lot. He says, well, you should be. And that's not comforting. <laughs> that's really not comforting. He said, you should be. And I'm amazed at how my ego will take the, go- the gifts that God has given and then take ownership of it. But that's what happens. My ego will take everything that God has done for me and all of a sudden take ownership and say, it did that. And I started doing a little gambling, and my wife was in Istanbul, Turkey, going to college. We didn't have kids at the time. Well, we, well not when that happened. We did end up, you know, by the time it got all clean. And I ended up, uh, well, I'll tell you another story because it's really important. Like, if I can't share this from the podium, then I shouldn't even be talking anywhere. I got so spiritually sick in Alcoholics Anonymous while I was actively speaking and sponsoring lots of guys and going into the prison. I was a big mover in the prison. I went to the prison ever. I just fell in love with prison work. Even while I was sponsoring lots of guys in there, I was living this dishonest life over here. And I'd stop gambling, but the financial debt, it's like God will never, he'll never come anywhere I don't invite him. And I just did not want to invite, I've invited him into my gambling, but I did not want to invite him into my financial problems because it would have been, the truth is, I would have had to get honest to my wife. And what would that make me look like? I'd have to get honest to the guys I sponsor and this image I have about who Brian P. is. And it's all a lie, it's all fraud. There's nothing authentic about it. And I was speaking at a young people's conference in Philadelphia, and Chloe had found some stuff out about some stuff, which is pornography. And she's like, so what's going on with this? And I'm like, well, you know. And she says, is there anything else you want to tell me? And I had all this huge financial debt that I've been sending all my bills over to my office, and I was doing it that way. You know, like I was trying to pay it off one at a time, and, and, uh, and it wasn't working. And she said, is there anything else you need to tell me? And I said, no. I lied to the woman I love. No, to protect my ego. And the next day, I, went, I spoke Friday night. The next day, I went down to a young people in service workshop. And, every, they, and the guy was talking about what a great speaker, the Friday night speaker was. He's talking about me. And all I, I got physically ill. I started to get sick inside because I was a fraud. And I remember walking upstairs, and I said, Chloe, you want to put Quincy on a movie? We were pregnant with my son. I said, you need to put Quincy on the movie because I need to tell you some things. And it may end our marriage. I remember when I came back on Sunday, she, we went out to feed the horses, and she said to me, and I remember, I mean, my grand sponsor was there taping the event, and, I, and a guy that I sponsored came from Baltimore up to hang out with me, and I was a broken man. I was just like, I was, I was ground zero one more time. And uh, I, I walked out to the barn with her to feed the horses, and she looks over at me, and she says, you broke my heart. I mean, who does that? A selfish, self-centered alcoholic who's invested in his ego. That's who does that. You know, this woman that I love so dearly, you know, I haven't raised my voice to her. Like, I, I, I used to hang this hat. Like, I haven't raised my voice in an argument to her, nor has she raised her voice in probably 16, 17 years. And I just realized something today. Like, I don't do that because it's disrespectful, but the, the level of dishonesty in our relationship was just as disrespectful. It was nothing less. So I, I hang my hat on this fact that I don't yell at my wife and we don't raise our voices. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a really good thing. I mean, i got an 11-year-old daughter. My daughter has lived with us for 11 years. She's watched how I've treated her mother for 11 years. When they say practice these principles in all our affairs, that's what they mean. And I'm telling you, my daughter has never seen me disrespect her mom outwardly. But this backdoor disrespect is just as painful. But I know this, when my daughter starts dating and some boy starts disrespecting her or raises his, she's going to know, like, that ain't how a man treats a woman. And as equally important as my boy knows how to treat a woman, he knows how his dad treats his mother. And he knows how to treat a woman by how I live my life. When I started doing work in the prison system, Man, I got to tell you, there's some people in this room. We did a FOTS in prison. We did a, a FOTS, three-day FOTS inside the main state. 
penitentiary. I remember calling Tom and said, cash in your miles, I need people. And Jeff came, and, and Tom came, and Ken W. came, and we had Jeff, uh, Gerald was there. We, we went in, and we did a thought inside the prison. We ate lunch with the inmates. Because Don told me real clear, when I started doing work in the prison, I was like, nothing's working. They're, not, they're, not, they're just going to A means. He said, well, do something different. So I started taking guys through the 12 steps in prison. I started doing fifth steps in prison. I started for 14 years. I went every week. And not to pat on myself on the back, because that's what God would have me be. It's so selfish to be awakened and to not share that. I remember going in and, and sitting down with men who were broken. This is why I know my kids. I remember these guys used to come out to our meetings when they went to the farm. And I'll never forget it. This guy, was, his name is Lance. It's just a bulking FTW tattooed in his forehead. You know, like that's a commitment. I mean, he's a scary individual. And I remember, I didn't even think, my daughter was like four, and I said, I, some sponsee came into our home group, and they used to come to our home group, uh, and when they were at minimum security, they could come in. And I remember giving Lance, my daughter, I said, here, hold Quincy, and he just held her like this. He was never, you know, he'd been in prison so long, he was like frightened. And he told me, and I didn't, because I didn't think about it, because I said, I don't see the outside of you. I see the inside of you. And my daughter only saw that. And I remember my daughter was around. All these inmates would come over the house, you know, because they'd, they'd come out and they'd end up staying local. And uh, I remember I was telling Chloe, I said, I think, I can't, it was out of meditation. Like, I've got to tell Quincy my story. I've got to let her know. I mean, she's going to know. Those inmates are talking. All these guys are coming over. They know my story. I mean, it's going to come out. And I, I, I was going to go skiing with her. I was going to spend all day, and I told Claire, I said, I think tonight's the night. I think I'm going to tell Quincy. She's eight years old. I think she's mature enough to know what the story of her dad. I'm not going to tell her the deep, like, in a, in a general way. I mean, and, uh, <laughs> and I remember sitting down, and I said, hey, honey. I said, Dad, I, I need to tell you something. And she said, okay. And I said, so, and I told her that I'd been to prison for seven years. And as soon as I told her, I said, I just want to let you know that I've been to prison for seven years. I spent all my 20s in prison. And she burst out crying. I had that momentary thought, like, did I do something wrong? And she just was crying. And I go, what's going on, baby? And she goes, you must have been so lonely. And she just held me. She came in to help me. And she's like, this is the gift of, of children being raised in Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, you must have been so lonely. I said, yeah, baby, I was pretty lonely. And she stepped back and she wiped her tears and she said, is that why you go into the prison? Is that why you help those guys? I said, yeah, that's exactly why I do that. And I'm going to end with a story. I end with it all the time. It's, I, it, I don't think it loses lesser because it's been something that was amazing to me and it's still amazing to me. Uh, when Don had taught me, and I'm talking like Mickey came in. I've had lots of heavy hitters go into the prison and do workshops with these guys. And... Uh, I do group, we do group third steps, you know, I get, we have 20 guys and we just go through the book together. I take them right through the book, doctors have been all the way through, and then we do a group third step and then they write fourth step and I do fifth steps, or they started doing themselves. Now they sponsor themselves, now they do it themselves, and they're just doing it themselves. But one time, I had a lot of heavy guys, and uh, it was a rough crew, I mean, they challenged me and they were testing me, and, but they started to surrender to the process, and we did this... Uh, group third step prayer in this room and it was a glass windows and all the other inmates could walk by and see it and every time I must have been 30 groups I ran I did third steps I said so we if you're if I sponsor you on the streets we're going to kneel and we're going to say this third step prayer together how do you guys want to do it and they're like do it like on the streets you know and they pull the chairs back and and we started praying we did this prayer and I don't get visuals I'm not that type of guy I'm not a spiritual being that gets I don't get I mean I hear God a lot and sometimes I pay attention when I don't I get in trouble I pay attention a lot more today. But I got a visual of what my recovery had been like. And it was instant, and it happened really sudden. And, uh, and I questioned on whether I should share it with the inmates. I said, hey, I'm going to share something that just happened to me. It's never really happened before. I said, here's what it was like. I said, I just got this idea that I was like in this dark, dark forest of alcoholism. I was dark forest of alcoholism. I mean, I couldn't find my way out. I was stumbling around. I was walking in the trees, rocks. I just couldn't get out. And I met this guy named Ken W. And Ken appeared and he said, hey, you want to get out of here? And I said, more than anything. He said, well, then follow me and do everything I do. And I followed him and I did everything he did. And all of a sudden, I, the, the trees opened and I smelled like it was fresh air. I took a deep breath, and the sky was blue, and the grass was green. It was just beautiful. And he took a deep breath, and he goes, all right, let's go back in and get two more. And we go back in, and we get two more. And then four, 
and we take a deep breath and we go back in and we get four more. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm forever grateful for the men who walked before me, the men and women who trudged this road. Thank you so much. Thank you.